if you're given the first derivative graph, um, superimpose a uh, first derivative test uh, number line onto uh, the figure. And what you're going to do is identify all critical points. So in this case, the critical point is one that occurs at negative two and one that occurs at one. And then from there, we're reading the, the signs of the graph as in um, anything that is above means that the first derivative is positive. That's a positive y value. And then anything that is below is negative. So when I'm looking at this graph, I'm realizing that this is this means the original function is decreasing and then the uh, before one and then after one it's increasing so i'm going to superimpose a sign chart on there of the first derivative and read it as such okay so now when it says find x values of critical points i see that there's an x, uh, a critical point um, at one and it goes from um, negative to positive from decreasing the original function decreases then increases or uh, speaking calcu uh, calculus talk it would be the first derivative is negative then changes to positive and then it's equal to zero here so therefore the critical points definitely occurs at x equals one but it also occurs at negative two where this is again critical points are identified as just possible maxes or mins not guaranteed. And then when it asks you guys for, um, I'm going to answer question C, where it says find x values of the local mins and maxes. That's when I would say it occurs at x equals um, one is a min. And that's again because uh, f prime changes from negative to positive. So we would explain that if the question had asked you guys to justify or explain, um, make sure you guys mention what function, no pronouns, and then how it changes. Now going back to intervals of increase and decrease, all the parts that I highlight in blue are underneath the x-axis. Therefore, um, the first derivative is negative. So we'll say that it's uh, increasing on the interval from one to infinity. And then it decreases on the interval from uh, negative infinity to negative two, union negative two to one. Okay, and then find intervals of uh, concavity and then also points of inflection. So if this is the graph of my first derivative, my, uh, my second derivative, we're asking ourselves, well, how is the first derivative and the second derivative related to each other? So if I asked you guys, given the first derivative, how do you find the second derivative? You would say, say uh, take derivative to get from um, the first derivative to the second derivative. So what is the derivative on the graph of a function? So this is my first derivative graph. When I'm asked to find the derivative of it and interpret it graphically, that means it's the slope of the tangent line. So um, points of inflections are where your second derivative changes signs. So if the derivative of this is positive here, and then it changes to negative, and then negative to positive, well, the interpretation is if I have my first derivative graph, points of inflections are where the slope changes from positive to negative or negative to positive. So the points of inflection are going to occur at basically the mins and the maxes of your uh, first derivative graph. So negative two and um, x equals zero. So x values of negative two and zero are where it would occur. Intervals of concavity now, if I think of this um, as uh, intervals of concave up, concave up is where the graph is increasing or has a positive slope. So that would be here prior to negative two and then after x equals zero. So concave up would be from uh, negative infinity to negative two and from zero to infinity. And those are x values. Whereas concave down is the values in between that. So negative two to um, zero. And I'm sorry, I'm not looking at the chat. So I'm not sure how you guys are. Uh, let me pull that up real quick. Uh, can you guys type into the chat? How are you guys doing with that um, bit of information? Okay, so if you, yeah. And, uh, if you have questions on it, please make sure you guys do that worksheet. Uh, if you did it way too early, like some of you guys, I think, I didn't mean to uh, 
I, I always have these intentions of doing it in class and then we just, with an hour and 20 minutes, it's just never enough time. Um, if you need more time, or sorry, if you have completed that one worksheet earlier, if you could go back and just make sure it makes sense with the key, that would be great. Yes, points of inflections, what, what is a point of inflection? A point of inflection is where it changes concavity. So if I look at this graph as the first derivative and I'm looking um, for the second derivative information where there's a change in sign in the second derivative, then, um, okay, thank you, Audrey. I'll, I'll change that, um, the access information for week seven agenda. Uh, so it changes concavity when there's a change in signs in the second derivative. And the second derivative on the graph of the first derivative is the tangent line slope. So the slope of the tangent line goes from positive to negative at negative two, and then from negative to positive at x equals zero. So points of inflections are end up being your maxes and mins of your first derivative graph. Um, so yes, I will change that axis. And yeah, so it just continue, just continue to practice with it. Um, you can, uh, you can also practice with the second derivative graph, but this one is is really really important that you guys understand how to interpret the first graph, uh, first derivative graph, and um, understand concavity and flexion points, justifying it. Uh, so we will continue to practice into uh, the next chapter and then the following chapter even after that. Uh, so if I can have you now, we have uh, just under half an hour left. If I can have you guys scroll down to um, related rates. So let me show you guys what that looks like. It's this section here. Okay, someone had a question, which I'm going to come back to. Uh, when it, Um, and Min, let me clarify that question later. Uh, I think you're confused between the first derivative uh, graph versus the original function. So that, that function that we were looking at there was the graph of the derivative. Um, so that might, I don't know if that was enough to clear up your question, but I can clarify more either like if I have time at the very end of class or um, at a tutorial for you. Um, so on related rates, uh, we have, now this section in your current textbook is actually part of the previous chapter. In our old textbook, it was part of, um, it was part of the, uh, uh, of the current chapter. So it just, it's, it depends on where you want to put it, but I could have t taught you guys this related rates lesson which I think Mr. No has already done um, as part of the previous chapter, but I just like putting them all together as part of um, the unit where you're applying, it's pl applied derivatives. So this is an application of implicit differentiation. So think back to when you guys were taking the derivative and it was with respect to X, we didn't have to do implicit on it, but anytime you had like a derivative where you had to take it with respect uh, to x, but you're taking a derivative of y, we remember we have to multiply by y prime. And so uh, this uh, particular differentiation technique is very useful when we do word problems on related rates where there's a, a multitude of uh, quantities that are changing with respect to most oftentimes time. Okay, so you're given a situation like say uh, coffee is being poured into a coffee filter, the radius is changing with respect to time, the height is changing with respect to time, and the volume is changing with respect to time. So the time part is the third parameter. It's like you have now x, not only x and y, but you have a third variable time. And time is the one that you're taking it, uh, taking the deriv derivative with respect to. Um, so if y is not t, then I have to multiply by dy dt. If x is not t and I'm taking the derivative with respect to time, I have to multiply by dx dt. Okay, so that's a, a quick blurb on it. You're going to hear me say, um, create your no want and relate column. Uh, so I'll highlight that in this uh, section right here, your no wants and relate column. So they're going to give you information uh, that you'll put under the no column. And that is all the stuff that you know about the situation. 
the want part is, well, what is the question asking me to solve for? Is it asking me to solve for the rate of change of the height or is it of the radius? Um, so we'll fill that column out. And then the relate part is, how do I take what I know and what I want and relate all the variables together in one equation? And then we start taking derivatives from there. Okay, so let's start with just, uh, without any words to it, uh, just the, the math behind it. And then we'll jump into a, a, an example with uh, some math in it. Okay, so some examples uh, that I wanted to point out to you guys of uh, rates that you guys would see uh, with respect to time is dA dt, you might have to take the derivative. So when I read that, I read it as the derivative of area with respect to time. How is the area changing as time is changing? Um, dc dt would be the derivative of circumference. These are just examples. You don't have to like know anything about it, but these are just possible uh, uh, implicit values that you would uh, find as you're doing the derivative. dv dt volume, um, dx dt, dy dt are rates of change when we see situations like the first one we're going to do is, is with respect to a Pythagorean theorem question, um, and then dz dt as well. So example one, again, is just a straightforward, there's no uh, mathematical situation to it. It's just given an equation. So similar to what we've been doing um, in the previous chapter. So the difference in this chapter is that we're going to take the derivative with respect to time. So time is like our independent variable. So you guys are used to taking derivatives with respect to x. So this is independent uh, variable. So notice that t, and we'll say, we'll put in parentheses, the variable is t is different than the variables that I have here, y and x. So each time that I take the derivative of y, I'm gonna to have to multiply by dy dt. If I take the derivative of x, I'm gonna to have to multiply by dx dt. Neither y or x is t, so that's why I have to multiply by that uh, differential. So um, let's say we're gonna take the derivative of uh, y. We're gonna say the derivative of y is one power rule, um, and we're gonna multiply then by dy dt. We're gonna take the derivative of x, and this time it's just not 2x because we're not taking the derivative with respect to x, we're taking it with respect to t. So then what we do is we multiply by dx dt. So minus the derivative of uh, 3x, which is three, and then times by dx dt. Again, taking a derivative term by term of variables that are not what you're taking the derivative with respect to. You have to times by um, the derivative of the variable over the derivative of the third parameter. So in question B, it's all related. Find dy dt when x is equal to three and dx dt is equal to two. So now you guys are thinking of these as your, um, as your variables, dx dt and uh, x equals three, we're gonna plug those values into our equation and solve for, uh, solve for dy dt. Okay, so if I do that, I get dy dt equals two times parentheses, uh, plug in three for x, plug in two for dx dt, minus three times dx dt, which is two. So I end up with, this all simplifies to be 12 minus six, which in the end, dy dt is equal to six. The rate of change of y with respect to time is six when x is three and when the rate of change of x with respect to time is two. Okay, so um, using the same equation, this time, sometimes they'll ask you guys to find dy dt. Sometimes they'll ask you guys to find dx dt. So here they're giving you guys the variables x equals four and dy dt is equal to two. So through direct substitution, using the equation that you guys got from A, what we're gonna do is solve for dx dt. dy dt is two, so I'm gonna plug two in on the left. Uh, two times four, can you guys go ahead and solve for dx dt? And type into the chat, what do you think you get with it? Okay, excellent. Those of you guys who typed it in, that is all correct so far. Very nice. And so we're just going to get accustomed now to 
these rates of change being your variables that you're solving for. Very nice, you guys. So dx dt is equal to two fifths. Okay, so I every year I get some students, um, you guys, related rates is one of those topics. I, so I, it's not gonna be the only time I say this, but this is one section in this chapter. All the curve sketching part, I believe, takes uh, up four sections. It's the focus of applied derivatives is that curve sketching, the first derivative test, the second, all of that is super, super important. Related rates is one section of uh, applied derivatives. So please don't be so hard on yourself, one, if it's uh, difficult for you guys to understand some of these problems. Two, um, you give yourself some time. Some people, it clicks right away and they love related rates problems. I have that every year. And then there's, uh, I would say the majority will struggle a bit, um, get it eventually, maybe not love it, but understand it. Um, and then other people, just as long as they get kind of like a little push in the right direction and on how to set up the problem, they're okay. And it's, this is all true. If I told my students this in algebra one of word problems that they saw, with quadratics, um, it's generally true of that for them as well. So it's just like, you know, you guys are at this level with uh, related rates word problems instead of quadratics. So we're gonna scroll down to, um, and I, every year I mean to interchange the order of some of these examples because I like to go from easier to harder. So what's gonna happen is today, we have like about 15 minutes left, which is perfect. I'm going to go over just one example with you guys, which happens to be example three. So really, I'm going to go over this one with you guys today. There's three examples left um, for which I have recorded a play posit. The play posit is just to st um, string all the examples together, but there's no questions on the play posit. So I'll give you guys a link to the play posit. Um, when you come to class on Wednesday, you'll have um, the quiz to take, which I didn't want to give you guys too much uh, of a rush on time. So uh, I like the idea of just having you guys watch the video after you're done with the quiz at your own pacing. Um, so I've pre-recorded the videos for the three examples. And then um, once you're done with the quiz, you guys can start on the video and then attempt the problems. And that way, if you are done with the quiz, you're done with the video, you guys can start asking me um, private chat questions if you guys have any on how to set up some of the homework problems. Now, I, I typed up problems for you guys in the packets. And there's a lot of them, so I'm not going to assign all of it. However, um, when we get to uh, the review part of it, I'll start to say, hey, can you guys finish up those problems that you had in your homework on related rates or optimization? I put a ton on there because I know, you know, kids always want extra practice so that it's there for you eventually um, cover it on the review. So I tried to parse it out so it's not too overwhelming. OK, so we have the classic ladder problem here. OK, so you have a ladder. Um, and actually, just real quick, you guys, when you think of the ladder problem, think of geometry. You've seen this in geometry, but not, nothing with rates of change. When you think of a ladder leaning against a wall, which, what shape does it form? And what equation comes to mind to you guys, even without reading the problem? Okay, um, many of you guys are typing in right triangle, perfect. Okay, so right triangle, what's the very first thing you guys learned with right triangles? Uh, Pythagorean theorem, perfect, okay, so that's it, okay, so the problems where you guys have a triangle in it, you're going to think the relate part is going to be Pythagorean theorem, so I always, um, just so that you guys know, and it's not right or wrong, but I always have the one, uh, the, the leg that is horizontal, my x, and the leg that is vertical, my y, and that just makes sense with x axis being horizontal and y being um, vertical, and then, and of course, it's not wrong if you interchange it, just keep track of it. And so when you're looking at solutions, just uh, make sure that you're looking at the corresponding parts correctly. And then the latter part of it, um, I usually make my Z. So let's go ahead and sketch the picture. So you have a ladder that's 10 meters uh, long, leaning against a vertical wall. So there's my wall. Here's my ladder. My daughters were watching me um, uh, draw this and they're like, oh, what are you doing drawing a slide? So uh, apologi apologies for it not looking like a, a ladder if it looks like a slide. Um, so here you guys have that this variable is x, this variable is y, and this variable is z. Please, please draw a picture, label all your problems um, with the variables um, so as you guys are getting accustomed to what's uh, happening with the related rates problem. So under uh, 
another problem, what I usually do is write three columns. The no and the want, you don't really need much space for it. So I always kind of leave the right hand side with more space for the relate part because that's where we're going to solve all, all our problems once we relate everything. Okay, so now we assign variables. So all these variables that we were doing above in this example, there's going to be variables associated with x, with y, and their rates of change. So here, a, a, a ladder is 10 meters long. So we know that z is equal to 10. And in parentheses, what I like to also keep in mind is things like what's changing as the ladder is sliding. So let's read the full problem. If the bottom of the ladder slides out at a rate of one meter per minute, how fast is the top of the ladder descending when the bo bottom is six meters from the wall? Okay, so as your ladder is going down, let's keep note of something. Okay, so as this ladder is sliding down, you'll notice that the distance between um, the top of the ladder and the uh, floor is decreasing. So this rate of change is gonna be negative. So there's gonna be direction tied to it. So as the ladder is sliding out, um, this is going down, the top of the ladder is going down. So dy dt is gonna be negative. Uh, you guys, is dx dt going to be positive or negative? Is the rate of change of x, is it increasing or is it decreasing? Yeah, so as the ladder is sliding out, you'll see that dxdt is increasing, so dxdt should be positive. Uh, what's happening to dz dt? Or what is, what is z? Is z changing at all as the ladder is sliding down? Is, is the length of z or changing at all? It's not changing. So what I'd like you guys to write inside the parentheses is that this is a fixed amount. So as the, the ladder is sliding down, only X and Y are changing. Okay, sometimes you guys have Pythagorean theorem problems where all three things are changing, which we'll see in another example. But for this one, it's important to know it's fixed. Okay, then other things are the bottom of the ladder is sliding out at a rate of one uh, meter per minute. So I know this is going to be a D something DT. Okay, it's a rate of change. So what is it? Is it dx dt or dy dt? If the bottom of the ladder slides out at a rate of one meter per minute, how fast is the top of the ladder descending? So is one meter uh, per minute that's given to us is something we know. Okay, so if it's sliding out at one meter uh, per minute, is that my dx dt or dy dt? What do you guys think? It's dx dt. It's sliding out from the bottom. So it's how that that uh, how this length is changing with respect to time. So dx dt is one, and um, now we go to what we want. Okay, so now the question part. The question part is how fast is the top of the ladder? How fast is the top of the ladder descending when? And fast that's a rate of change. Okay, so how fast it's sliding is d y dt and it's talking about descending. Um, so what we want is dy dt. When the bottom of the, when the bottom is six meters from the wall. So what I do is I also draw this bar and that bar is to say we want dy dt at a specific moment in time when the bottom is six meters away from the wall. What variable would you guys assign to six? What is that giving me information on? Like, okay, very good. So dy dt, what, the question is, what is dy dt when x is equal to 6? Okay, so now you guys take a step back. You have all the information you know and you want. Okay, all of this, how is, how is z, x, and y related? And you already answered that question um, at the beginning. Pythagorean theorem, x squared plus y squared equals z squared. Now, if I know from my note, Parts. And I always stop at this point to just kind of assess the situation. If I know that something is fixed, in my equation, I'm going to plug that fixed value in before I take the derivative. Okay, so the reason is that it's, it's going to affect my derivative. Because if you guys have a constant value plugged into that, and what's the derivative of a constant? It's zero. Okay, so if we don't have that uh, that 10 squared plugged in, you're gonna have a dz dt. And I guess you guys can do it and then just say dz dt isn't changing, the rate is zero, and you get zero that way as well. But then it just convolutes the problem a little bit more. So if something is fixed, just plug that value in um, before you do the derivative. 
Okay, so now at this point, we're ready to tie everything together with derivatives. So this is the calculus part of it. And I'll, I'll switch colors for this, uh, just so you guys know I'm starting to take the derivative. So here I have the derivative of x, and remember it's with respect to time. So implicit differentiation times 2x, or sorry, times dx dt plus 2y times dy dt, implicit. And again, carried forward all the way through, uh, the derivative of 10 squared r 100 is zero. And so at this stage, we would know we're in the right direction when we have information on everything that we have um, as variables we can plug in. Okay, so we're gonna go back to our equation and now plug things into it. And I'll just kind of do it off on the side here so that um, you guys can see, but two times x, what do you, uh, what value would you guys plug in for x? What value would you guys plug in for x? Okay, perfect. It's at the moment in time when x is six. So we're gonna plug six in. And then dx dt is also a variable they gave me. It's one. And then plus uh, two times y. And y in this case is, um, is not given to me. Okay, so y is not given to me. So the question is, well, if they want it at the moment in time when x is six and z is 10, always because it's fixed how do you guys think you guys come up with this y value i'm missing the y value how do you guys think you come up with the y y value for this okay good pythagorean theorem plug it back into pythagorean theorem can you guys go ahead and do that or in your minds you guys should know this special triangle right you have a six blank 10 triangle what what is the value of y eight okay so just kind of make a note of that um this is you guys solving for y is at the moment in time when x is six you guys have six squared plus y squared is equal to um 10 squared so y is equal to eight very good okay so then we take that eight value and maybe i'll highlight it so that because there's lots of uh, information going on here um y equals eight i'm going to plug into here that's how i got that value and then um, we're trying to solve for dy dt. So that's gonna be my variable. And all of that is set equal to zero. Okay, so simplify things out. You guys have 12 plus 16 uh, dy dt equals zero. Subtract the 12 and divide by 16. And we get dy dt is negative three fourths always tie a unit of um, unit to your rate of change and since y is measured in minute meters and the time is minutes it's negative three four three fourths meters per minute is your actual answer and i'll highlight the answer here um just quick question when you, why is dy dt negative why is dy dt negative okay Perfect, y is decreasing. So my suggestion to you guys as you're doing this, um, these problems, very good, um, is that you're verifying that it makes sense in terms of uh, the sign change. Okay, so if it's uh, negative and one is positive, one should be increasing, one unit should be increasing while the other is decreasing. And that 